Hello everybody, this is Mrs. Molesky, and today we are going to be talking about prehistoric Egyptian and Greek art. Now when we talk about art, one of the things that we have to remember about this course is that we are going to get from prehistoric to postmodern. That's a lot of content to cover in just one year of class. If you were at a collegiate level taking this course, you would be moving at a much slower pace, delving much deeper into each one of these movements, as well as covering additional movements. This by no means is the extent of the art history information that is out there. Usually at this point, I grab one of my enormous art history college books that's about six inches thick and show you guys how much art history there really is out there. So even though we may not be covering some art movements and cultures, that doesn't mean they aren't important. It just means that we are physically strapped for time in this course. And even the movements that we do talk about, we're only going to be kind of hitting the high points. So we're just going to be doing a glancing blow at a lot of different movements to try to get you guys up to speed. The other thing that I would like you guys to remember about this course is that we are moving in a linear fashion. So we're starting with prehistoric and we're going to move forward in time. You can't talk about prehistoric Egyptian and Greek art um, without understanding what came before. So obviously with prehistoric, there's nothing that came before. But for example, if we were going to talk about um, Impressionism art, we have to know what happened before that that made Impressionism possible. So when we talk about prehistoric art, the first thing that we need to talk about is ancient sculpture. Ancient sculpture is the oldest surviving art form that we have. And these are typically made of really hard things that exist in society. So bone, ivory, stone, antlers. And when we look at the art today, we're going to look at you know, a couple of different types of art. So the first one is a three-dimensional form of art. So this is made out of stone. This is the Venus of Willendorf. And the Venus of Willendorf is a fertility uh, sculpture that was very, very small. It's only about four or five inches tall. So it was something that was easily transportable. This is considered to be the oldest known surviving art artifact. It was discovered in Willendorf, Germany, hence the name Venus of Willendorf. We actually do not know what the ancient peoples called the Venus of Willendorf, what the name for this piece would have been. We call it the Venus of Willendorf due to the fact that it was found in Willendorf and that it is very clearly a fertility statue due to its exaggerated features. When we look at something like the dying lioness as an ancient sculpture, what we're seeing is something here carved in relief, which means that this is kind of a slightly raised uh, sculpture. So when you run your hand across the front of this, you would feel where the stone comes up to depict the lioness. You wouldn't see the lioness on the back, however, if you walked around to the backside of this slab. So that is something to, important to understand. It is just a flat um, sculpture. It's not three-dimensional like the Venus of Willendorf. Now, not all of the ancient sculptures are small. Some of them are incredibly large. These are the Easter Island monoliths. Monoliths meaning huge. And so these are incredibly tall sculptures that were created by the ancient peoples of Easter Island. And so they're actually quite a bit of them are buried underground. Um, and so you just see these heads peeking out throughout the Easter Islands. The next type of painting, the next type of art we're going to talk about is painting. So when we talk about painting in ancient peoples, we're really going to be talking about cave paintings. And the reason that we're talking about cave paintings is that these are the things that still exist. I am sure that ancient peoples created paintings in other forms, but unfortunately, we don't have evidence of those paintings because they simply broke down and degraded over time, which is why the existing paintings that we do know of are deep inside caves where humans can't destroy them or impact them in a negative way, as well as the fact that they're protected from light. So the first uh, set of images we're going to look at here is the cave paintings at Le Coe, France. Now, 
I am not a French speaker. So if I do mispronounce something, please just bear with me. Um, it is something I'm trying to work on. I'm often running down to Madame and asking her to correct my pronunciation of things. But so anyways, this cave painting at Le Co France. When we look at these cave paintings, one of the things that we should notice is that it's often of animals. So we're seeing a lot of animals. We're seeing bison, we're seeing deer, we're seeing horses. The other thing that we often will see are these things that are arrows. So we have these arrows right here. Because hunting was very, very important to ancient people. Additionally, one of the things that I often hear students say when we're talking about these paintings is, is that doesn't look like a horse like we know it. Well, number one, we have to understand that ancient animals look different than our modern animals. So there will be some differences. But the other thing that we have to remember is that these cave paintings are painted in dark caves and they're often quite high up on the walls. So when you are looking up on the walls, you're up. So you imagine that these people had to either be working with very, very um, long sort of paintbrushes on sticks, or maybe they had built some sort of rudimentary sort of scaffolding in order for them to reach those sections of the caves. The other thing that's really important to remember is that these paintings were made when there was no electric light. So in this picture, we can see there is electric light. They didn't have that. They were doing all of this by torchlight or firelight. So when we think about the fact that some of these paintings are very simplistic and not, you know, um, incredibly complex, that is for a variety of factors. Um, they were a nomadic people. They were working in poor lighting conditions. They were working at a large scale and they were working at an elevated level. So it's hard for all of those things to kind of come together um, and make an incredibly complex uh, visual painting like we would expect from modern artists. That's all we're talking about for prehistoric. See, we have to move quite quickly. Here we're gonna talk about Egyptian art. So Egyptian art follows this very strict formula for both paintings and sculpture that we're gonna look at. It feels very stiff, very static. Um, so when we look at the first set of sculptures here, um, please notice that none of the parts are like kind of extending, like there isn't an arm stretched outward. The arms and legs are kept close to the body so that those parts aren't breakable. We often see people depicted from the front or from sort of like the side. Um, kind of partially turned towards the side. That's what that means by bisymmetrical there. These sculptures have lasted for a very, very long time. So when we look at Abu Simbel, when we see this, we see their hands and their arms are very close to their body and their hands are resting on their, on their legs, which is sort of a very formal, unnatural way for us modern people to kind of sit. Um, I know that when people have asked me to sit like this, it always feels a little uncomfortable. Um, the weight is evenly distributed across their feet, across their bodies. They're forward facing. Same thing here for the Menkar Triad. When we look at this, you see that there's a vague step forward, but the arms are still very, very close to the body. And when you look, you don't see any gap between the arm and the waist. There's actually still part of the stone in place, and that is to help prevent things from breaking off. If you haven't realized it by now, a lot of ancient Egyptian sculptures are quite large. Um, and when you think about it and you look at the beauty of these pieces and you see that they are very smooth and delicate, like, and they were working with ancient tools. Like nobody had like a sander, a belt sander out and is sanding this the stone down to that perfect smoothness. It's really very, very incredible. So one of the things I always like to talk about is how we as modern people have very few original ideas. On the left here, you see Hepshetzit's obelisk. Now Hepshetzit is a totally amazing Egyptian pharaoh. She took power. She's there's some controversy, um, potentially the first Egyptian 
pharaoh that was a woman i have been reading recently that they believe there was someone that came before her but she sort of seized power from her son and became pharaoh of egypt and so she erected this obelisk and then we have on our on the right something that we as americans are very very familiar with which is the washington monument so clearly we were deeply influenced by Hatshepsut's obelisk to create our own for our own first president. Egyptian paintings, again, we have rigid figures. We often have things in sort of a semi-profile view. The bodies are turned in very odd ways where the feet are facing to the side, the feet, the feet and the leg are facing to the side, but yet the upper torso is facing us. So it's a very, but then the heads turn to the side too. It's just very odd. The size of the person in the painting also denotes their rank. So these larger people here in the center, this is a god, this is a pharaoh, um, and here um, this is probably a wife or a lesser son. And then we have a very large person here. This is Osiris. This is one of the Egyptian gods. So the size of the person denotes their rank in the painting. And see what I mean by like, we're seeing like a front view of their shoulders and torso, but then we're getting like this side profile view of their feet, as well as a profile view of their face. It's, it's an unusual stylized form of painting. Again, here is Book of the Dead. We're seeing that stylized sort of twisted body formation in these people. And again, we have quite a lot here. Um, this is done on um, papyrus. So this is a very ancient sort of um, painting um, material that people would paint on. Okay, we're moving on to Greek art now. So here we have to talk about Greek and Greece and their breakthrough. They created something called trompe l'oeil. And it's this illusion that painted objects are three-dimensional. They became masters of this. And so here we have still life with a glass bowl of fruit and vases. So we're thinking here, think about what we just looked at with the Egyptian painting. Very stylized, uh, very formulaic. This looks much more like what we think of when we think of a still life painting. We can see that there's three-dimensional shape. We can see that there's um, implied three-dimensional form. So there's a lot of really interesting shadows and highlights. It almost feels as if you could reach out and pick one of these things up, one of those pieces of fruits, um, those are pomegranates, um, pick one of the pomegranates out of the bowl and eat it. As opposed to if we're looking at something, you know, like the Greek, where if there was food in this, um, over here we have a lotus, you know, that doesn't feel like something we could actually physically pick up. Now we're going to talk about Greek vases. So there are two types of Greek vases. There were two styles. You can tell which form you're looking at based on the colors that are in it. Um, so the earliest style was this sort of red clay with black forms. And then the later style was an opposite. So it was a black um, a black base with a red form. So it was kind of inverted. So early form, red base, um, black forms. So here we have Dionysus in a sailboat. And typically in class, I would ask who knows what Dionysus is the god of. Dionysus is the god of wine. And so we can tell that Dionysus is the god of wine because here at the top, we can see all of these grapes and grapes make wine. So therefore we know that this is Dionysus and he is in his sailboat. Um, you can see the incredible amount of detail. Look at the detailing on this sailboat that he has, like this beautiful sort of dolphin fish-like uh, head here, as well as an incredibly detailed tail. Now, this is an example of the later version. So we have that black base. So th this part is black. And then we have these red forms. Now you may be thinking, that doesn't look red, Mrs. Molesky. I understand. It is what we consider red. You have to remember, these are incredibly old objects. And so sometimes their colors fade and change over time. So when we look at this, this is the Medea's name vase. 
there is an incredible amount of detail that we have here. You can see that we have all of these different women here. They all have different types and styles of clothing on. Their dresses look different. Their bodies look different. Their hair looks different. So you can see that it wasn't like all of these women just had a one size fits all. Like this woman looks to have like some sort of very curly hair and then some sort of like headdress or you know set of ribbons something and here this person has their hair up um, this person appears to maybe potentially have some braids in their hair so these are very complex complicated uh, ceramic pieces and again here's another example of a later one I just think the colors on this are so rich and beautiful and um, you can really start to see where we get that idea of the um, the red happening here this is Hercules attacking a centaur now when we talk about Greek sculpture we have to talk about this amazing thing that they began to understand and it's the fact that when we stand we stand typically with our body weight resting on one part of our body so if you were to stand up right now and instead of trying to stand flat-footed if you stood naturally you'll find your weight sort of like moving back and forth and like naturally coming to rest on one of your two legs so this is something called contraposto. And the Greeks became really, really adept at creating this idea of contraposto so that sculpture starts to look more dynamic, more realistic. So here on the far left, you can see an example of an Egyptian sculpture. Remember, very stiff, very formal. And then here we start to see a little bit more of that contraposto or that smoothing out and, and like separating of the of the features here. Um, so like the arms start to be separated from one another, the legs start to be separated from one another in our archaic Greek. But then we get to the classical Greek and this feels very natural. The knee is bent. The weight is resting here on one side. So this is Dory Foros by Polyskatos. Um, and again, Greek, not my language, so I may have just butchered that a little bit. But when we look here, again, we have this straight leg, okay? We have this straight leg where the weight appears to be, you know, uh, resting. And then we have this bent leg. And then with the arms, they feel really natural. It feels as if we are seeing Dory Foros in this sort of like stop motion sort of, act, you know, um, action. Same thing here with the Aphrodite of Canados. We can see here um, the weight is resting on this leg. Her other leg is bent. Um, her arms feel like they're in a very natural position. Um, you'll notice here that her arms are resting on this beautiful decorative vase. This is incredibly common um, because if this arm was just kind of out here in space, it would be prone to breakage. Um, so when we see this arm resting here, that's to provide a little additional support so this is less fragile and less prone to breaking. Now I think this one is absolutely unbelievable when we look at it. You can see this discus thrower in complete arrested emotion. Besides the fact that this discus thrower has an incredible physique, um, that's one of the things that you'll notice especially about Greek and Roman statues. Often um, the, the male physiques were overly muscled. So here we can see, you know, the discus thrower totally has like a major six pack and you can see all the muscles in their legs and in their arms and even in their shoulders. So just notice how beautiful the arrested motion is here. Um, the weight is resting on this forward leg here. You can see that this leg is sort of bent and turning. Even the toes are like curling under. If you've ever watched a discus thrower in real life, this is an accurate depiction of what a discus thrower looks like. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about here um, is Greek architecture. And remember when I was talking about the um, Hepchatsis obelisk, we stole so much from Greek architecture. You will see Greek architecture everywhere once you realize what you are looking at. So here we have the Parthenon. And so when we think about these columns um, that are in front of us, those columns seem very iconic for our 
um, sculpture, or I'm sorry, for our architecture here in the United States. We have lots of buildings that have those sorts of columns. The Lincoln Memorial has columns. The White House has columns. Those are all classical Greek columns. You see those all over. They're not just in DC though. We have these columns everywhere. We have these columns downtown here in Milwaukee. So there are three types of columns. We have the Doric, which are the sort of the less embellished. They're a little bit more um, plain, if you would like. Then we have Ionic, which have a beautiful scroll work top. And then we have the Corinthian. And so these Corinthian have leaves on them, sort of this beautiful leaf motif. Now, you may be thinking, it is hard for me to remember which one of these is this. Um, the easiest way for that I have remembered things is that the Corinthians like to eat leaves. I don't know that that's true, but if I can remember that, because it's such a silly phrase, I can remember that Corinthians, Corinthian columns have leaves. And then when we look at the Ionic, um, you just have to think of Ionic and like swirls. That's what I do. And then Doric is boring. It's not. It's beautiful. We actually have a lot of Doric columns in our Washington architecture, but um, it's just a way to try to remember these things. So next time you are downtown, I highly encourage you to look at all the buildings. Um, you will see that here we have um, Corinthian columns here on the front of Northwestern Mutual's main building downtown. And we have a stylized Corinthian column. Um, for their logo. So this is something that like we are still using today, which is one of the really important aspects of art history is that even though these things took place so very long ago, they still influence the things that we see and think about all the time. So this has been the first set of notes, uh, the prehistoric Egyptian and Greek notes. We will be going over the next ones shortly.